This week on Indie Game Riot, we'll be keeping some graveyards while simulating the universe. Then we're going to sizzle and stew up something good on episode 157 of Indie Game Riot. I am Josh, joined by Mr. Ian McCammett. Hello. That's him over there. I'm me over here. Uh, I'm not pointing to anything, but that's okay. Uh, it's been a little bit. Uh, you, Those of you who are new may not know, but for those of you who have been around know that uh, Ian recently uh, moved to Canada. Because of that, we, we were kind of expecting there to be um, lack of content because, uh, you know, He's moving, doesn't have internet, that sort of stuff. Finally got internet set up. He's on currently a shitty laptop. He says he has good internet. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> I was told. I was told that my internet is Canadian just Canadian under... megabytes are different from American megabytes. They're... <laughs> the exchange rate is uh, yeah, the, it's the train war. That's uh, that's what's doing it. Uh, so apologize for any uh, like roboticness from his end or choppiness or anything like that. But you know we're working with what we got. Otherwise we'd have to wait longer until uh, Ian's able to get his uh, actual computer up and running. Um, and I've just missed you so much. So two weeks and I'll have my my beautiful space machine up and running again. His his apartment's very blank. He's sitting on uh, egg cartons and um, I'm, <laughs> egg cartons. What? Anyway. Egg. I'm, I'm I'm only this tall. I'm, I'm a, I, I look big, but but it's all a trick of the camera. <laughs> just your legs are like like just little nubs, and the rest of you is fine. Yeah, um, yeah. And according to my my latest Weight Watchers weigh in, I'm down to 230 pounds, which makes me incredibly dense at only six inches tall. <laughs> You're 230 pounds. I am, man. I've, wow. I've lost, I've lost. I'm sorry. I I, I, I uh, I'm 200. Five, Congratulations, so. sir. You're making me jealous. Thank you. Hey, are we allowed to do endorsements? It's all thanks to Fresca. No, <laughs> it's all thanks to Weight Watchers. I'm now now you got to contact Fresca and be like, hey, you want to you wanna sponsor us? I want to get that, that diet soda money. That's Actually, I, I kind of do the same thing because I, I, with between diabetes and me also trying to lose weight. I, I stick with like the I, what, what there was something that I had that was similar to uh, Lacroix. It might have oh, yeah, might have been yeah, like yeah. Deer Park or something, but it, was, it, it wasn't that bad. And it, speaking of Lacroix, regular Lacroix is nasty, but they have this like Lacroix where it's like they mix two different flavors, and for whatever reason, that's a lot more flavorful and, and not as gross. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, I, am I That's a Lacroix good. boy? I'm a, I'm a fan of bubbly waters of all time. Um, well, a lot, so of, a, lot of the, a lot of that stuff is like has that aspartame flavor in it. And just kind of, ugh, I don't like that. Oh, right. Well, Lacroix isn't, isn't really sweetened at all, is it? No, I think it it's, just has like a, like a slight bit of fruit flavor. The essence, the es essence of seltzer Lacroix. water and essence of fruit. Prep, prep disapproves in the chat. Of uh, he's probably right to do so. I probably. Don't know. Yeah. My mom. Yeah. The the vast majority of that stuff is, is nasty, but I had like a strawberry kiwi one that was not too bad, surprisingly. So, uh, anyway, how's it been since the last time we had a show? It's uh, been brutal, absolutely. So. Uh, uh, people who've been following my saga a little bit will know that I, uh, I applied for a student visa in Canada, which like didn't come. Uh, and then, uh, uh, basically the upshot, I've no shame. I'm, I can share with you that, uh, there's a juvenile record incident, uh, the pot. I think we talked about this last week. Uh, I had like half a gram of weed when I was 17 and, and, uh, they needed to see like court paperwork. And, uh, so we went to the court to get the paperwork 
percent the paperwork. So I sent this really heartfelt letter to the Canadian immigration people and was like, look, I have tried everything in my power to get this fucking document and the court won't give it to me. Uh, you know, what should I do? And literally on the first day of school, the 4th of September, they approved my study permit. So me and my girlfriend had to leave everything behind and immediately jump in the car. And well, first we had to renew my passport. Uh, otherwise I would have had to do that when I was up here. And then we had to drive up to Canada with like basically just like three suitcases full of clothes and my computer tower, but no monitor. So that's sort of pointless. So yeah, so then I got here and did my first uh, two weeks of class, which has been awesome. And now I'm here and I'm very happy to be doing this show again. Well, if, How any, about of you? You, if any of you aren't, there are uh, some of Ian's classmates. Well, welcome and thank you for for checking it out appreciate it if you're not then fuck off i'm just kidding um <laughs> i'm all right i uh i recently celebrated my eighth anniversary so that was cool congratulations i got a pickleball paddle for my for my uh for my anniversary gift so yeah pickleball pickleball yeah i think i told you about that i play pickleball for like exercise Oh, maybe. I don't know. I don't think we've ever talked about anything called pickleball. What is it? I thought I did because there's this, because I thought I talked about it because there's like some there's like some older people, a lot of older people that play it uh, in the group that I'm in, and uh, some of them kick my ass because they have the technique down right. So, but anyway, pickleball's like um, it's similar to it's like it's like a cross between tennis, badminton, and ping pong i would say um bad the only reason it's similar to badminton is because you're playing up close to the net like badminton um whereas tennis because it's a racket sport and you're playing over a net just like in tennis but you play closer to the te- to the net and then ping pong because it's like you're basically using a wiffle ball and these like paddles um some of them are wooden but most people use these uh this one's has a fiberglass face some of them are like a graphite composite type thing but uh it's it's actually pretty fast paced and i i sweat quite a bit doing it and i get sore so it's it's you know even though a lot of older people are playing at least in my group uh it it keeps you it keeps you moving yeah it's pretty fun too hey I used to do like Muay Thai, like combat fitness, and like literally everyone but me and my buddy, like middle aged women, they were like infinitely more badass than we were. <laughs> I like to have to go back to the hospital after one class. These ladies were like, you know, doing these ridiculous well, escapes and shit. There's this one, like, there's, there's, there's several that are challenging and they could beat me at any time, but I can hold my own and I beat them sometimes as well. But there is this one lady who I have beaten. <laughs> But most of the time, she kicks my ass. She's fucking curmudgeoning as shit. So if you're on her team, so you don't want to be on her team or against her. Because when you're on her team and if okay. you fuck up, she's like, ha! Ah! Like, you know, like one of those types of things. Like, come on! Like, you're like, shuck. You just feel like shit. Uh, and then, and then, but if you're playing against her, she just fucks you up. She, she, she goes, she, she, she snipes your backhand, anything, any weakness that you have, and she makes, and like, I hate when I fuck up, but she makes me fuck up so much that I like it like ruins my day. So I have to like when I see her like in a like coming up in a certain group, I will like a lot of times purposely put my paddle because uh, you know we will like line up our paddles to see who goes next and that sort of thing. And I'll like make sure I'm not in her group <laughs> a lot of times. Uh, so, but but so the times I go in there with her, man, she pisses me off. And you know, it's not her. She's playing. That's all it is. But it just pisses me off, man. I get so angry. Um, I love this idea of you having this this arch rivalry with this uh, older woman. She's probably one of the oldest in the group. I'm not gonna lie. Um, <laughs> she, I think she's in her seventies. God, think. man. <laughs> she's and she's this little lady too. She's small, and she has this like power behind her serve. She knows where to put it. God. She's the Joker to your Batman. I get 
<laughs> yeah, now I now every time I play against her, I'm just gonna imagine her in Joker makeup. I don't know if that helps her well, or hurts. <laughs> so thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Anything yeah. else interesting? I'm trying to think. Ow! Fuck. Uh, I don't think so right now. Oh, um, I'd like to shout out uh, Vance, who I don't know if he's here in chat or not, but uh, I voiced in his upcoming game. I think it's going to be released in a week or so. Um, Poltergeist Treasure, which he released Unicorn Dungeon a while back, and Poltergeist Treasure is, I believe, a sequel to that. Uh, sequel or prequel? I forget what he said. But in, in, either way, it's part of the whole universe of his series of games. And uh, I play the, the voice of Grimble in that. I got to do, for the first time, uh, in an actual uh, casting, I got to do, like, this North Midwest, like, Minnesotian, Wisconsin, North Dakota accent. So that was, uh, that, that was interesting. So it was sort of the, the, oh, yeah, for sure, don't you know, sort of the Fargo thing? Oh, yeah. So... Yeah, yeah, it was. Yeah, it was basically like Fargo on steroids. <laughs> uh, we get the game just for that. <laughs> I I think it's gonna be. No offense, fans. I, mean, I, I don't. Sure, don't I'm sure quote, your design work is fantastic. Don't <laughs> don't uh, don't quote me on this, but I believe it's gonna be nine ninety nine. Uh, if he's here, you can correct yeah. me. But if that's wrong, but uh, yeah, he. Uh, I will say that. Don't underestimate it, um, just because you haven't heard of the series or anything like that. Um, it's 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 a different look to most than what most adventure games are, and it's it's an absurd absurdist comedy. And I really enjoyed Unicorn Dungeon. Um, it's it's it was funny and and just different from from most uh, adventure games like point and click adventures that you do. And it was, it was good. So I expect more f like more of that from Poltergeist Treasure. Definitely worth at least checking out that uh, you know one of his games just to see how it goes. Nice. Anyway, uh, you know what uh, is worth checking out as well? Oh, uh, would that be be some uh, sort of injection, perhaps? Oh yeah, getting that perhaps sweet, indie news injection. Sweet indie news injection to get you kicked out of Canada because drugs. Are you bored with the same old game? Yeah. Why, then give yourself an Indie News Injection. Thanks, Indie Games. This week, an Indie News Injection. Probably stuff that you've already heard about because it's been so long, but fuck it. Here we go. <laughs> the first thing we're talking about is RimWorld Beta 19. So, with that said, RimWorld, uh, if you've been following the RimWorld development, um... The, the, after RimWorld Beta 18, they were supposed to be coming out with 1.0. But turns out, uh, it became a whole lot of stuff that uh, just didn't, they couldn't fit into one out, uh, update, so they made it Beta 19 instead. Um, some of the bigger things that they've added in this update are bridges and turrets. The bridges are cool because previously uh, you just had to deal with the water, and water slows you down, your character's down as they cross it, and so if you're like trying to uh, you know, dealing with a raid and you're trying to get back to your base or something, you have to cross a river, then you end up slowing down, you can't get back in time, they get shot in the ass, and then your whole game's fucked up. Um, and then new turrets are pretty cool too, because I think they only had one basic turret, so this adds, uh, I think, other options um, to defending your base, uh, if you're into that sort of thing. I don't really use turrets a lot in RimWorld, but, uh, you know, hey, I know a lot of people that do, so congratulations on that. Um... Do you do you play Rimworld? I do not. No, um, I have, I have uh, on and off uh, sort of followed its uh, existence. Is it, it's very good. You're you're missing out on some life sucking. Like you you probably shouldn't play it now that you're in school. <laughs> I need something when I get out of school. I, I remember. I think um, I think this was the one that I uh, saw that sort of seemed like. Um, you know, had echoes of FTL, but, uh, you know, obviously mm. in, a, in a sort of colonial, space colonial setting. Um, I mean... It seems to have more, more uh, like, resource management be more like a... It's very much a real -time more... real-time strategy. It's very much thing. more like Dwarf Fortress. Um, in the oh, sense is, it, you, is it roguelike? 
uh, not. I mean, they focus the on light. they focus on generated story. It's it's never the same playthrough ever ever ever. Um, mm -hmm. So you settle a colony, and we covered Rimworld a long time back, but you know here's a quick refresher for everyone. Uh, Rimworld, you settle a colony on on a thing. Um, there's a the AI. There's an AI that that creates events that happen throughout the game. Um, and the AI is called a storyteller. And uh, there's different ones that you can do, and you can set them at different like challenge levels, that sort of thing. But uh, throughout the game, you build you're, it's a, it's a base builder resource management, um, uh, like uh, random narrative driven game. So as you're building up your colony, things will happen like people will uh, drop in on your colony and want to join, or someone will raid your colony from time to time. You'll make enemies and allies and uh, animals will go crazy and start attacking people. Uh, weather events. Um, there's like this bug alien race that might ev that eventually you'll come across, and they they're pretty hard. So you try not to do what you can not to come across them because they're usually hidden away in like these like abandoned uh, ruins, essentially. That you know, if you accidentally open up a wall, you're pretty much fucked unless you're ready for it. Um, you know that sort of thing, and, and you. A lot of people play it min maxing. A lot of people play it like role play. However you want to do it, it's good for both. I I prefer role play over min max. I never really enjoy min maxing in anything. Um, and, and the uh, the sort of uh, you know story generation is is it's compelling, man. Uh, it works. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's not like standard narrative where it's a story. It's more like you're creating your own story because right, it's depending on how you respond narrative. to it. People die. It's permadeath, so people die, and then, uh, you know, that's part of your story. You know, disasters are part yeah. of your story, but then it's also part of your story when you, you get people to join, or you know, or you find something really incredible that helps your calling out a lot. That sort of thing. And, and I think the, I have never gotten to an end game, but I believe the end game is to rocket yourself off of the uh, uh, the planet. Um, but I've never gotten to that point, so I've never even seen it to be honest. But that it is sounds really cool. It is. It's a lot of fun. Um, some other things, by the way, there's also a new generator, water mill generator, fabrication bench that you, that you can now um, create uh, some advanced tech at. Because um, I think there was a lot, some, some advanced stuff that you couldn't craft previously. Um, some other, like, some small stuff that, that is more of like a quality of life, you know, sort of thing. Um, they added some new items, like some prosthetic, uh, prosthetic body parts that you can... Uh, tack on to people if you'd like, or if they get something cut off, you can replace it. Um, all sorts of stuff. There's a whole there's a whole thing that you can check out. The link will be in the description of the recorded version of this video. If anyone in chat wants it, uh, just say something and we'll send it to you. Um, anyway, that's what's happening with RimWorld Beta 19. And by the way, because I'm not doing my job, here's the logo for RimWorld. That was supposed to be there, but it wasn't. There you go. <laughs> Next, <laughs> IndieK. Uh, IndieK 2018 is on its way. Rev, uh, for those of you who don't know, was has been a, a host for a long time previously, but due to various situations, was not has not been able to be a host on the podcast. But he still does stuff for us from time to time, including covering things out west because he's from California. Uh, in which case, IndieK is in the west, and he'll uh, in Santa Monica specifically. And he'll be covering that for Indie Game Riots uh, as it comes up. Every time they do indicate, there's a festival that they have, and they have uh, nominees for various awards. Uh, the nominees for this year include things like Accounting Plus, Fire Escape, uh, Any Balls. And by the way, they keep for indicate they they do indie games obviously, uh, but they do like all different kinds of, of indie games, including VR and physical games, uh, whether it be a board game or like a lot of times they indicate they'll have a game night where uh, you play these games and a lot of it's like uh, just it, it's just you just need people and rules, that sort of game, you know what I mean? Like there's not like physical pieces to the games, just you know, rules that you're following. But anyway, they do that sort of stuff. Um, let's see, Bluebeard's Bride, just aren't some ones that I've heard of before. Shapes and Beats. Just Shapes and Beats, excuse me. Um, one of the like physical games I was talking about is Escape from Godot, I think is how it's pronounced. Yeah. Uh, see, every ones I recognize. A lot of the stuff is is really under the radar stuff that 
I've not heard of before, and I, I appreciate the fact that they do that. Um, I've gone to Indicate East, which is in New York, um, in Queens, but um, What the Golf is another one. But that one's a little, it always, that one has a different feel. Like this one's much more of a party, has a lot more uh, variance in, in the games that they, they have. Uh, Indicate East is very more uh, for that specific, it's very much more for industry than it is for fans, it seems. Not that you can't go if you're a fan, but it's just how it feels. Um, and they kind of have like some bigger names and, and that sort of stuff there rather than these like stuff that you haven't heard of. Um, they also have uh, Indicate Europe, um, which takes place in Paris. And uh, there's nominees for that as well. And some of them are also the same as uh, the one from Indicate West. Um, but some new ones too. There's one called Healer's Quest and Carly and the Reaper Men. I've not heard of these, but uh, I thought that said Demon's Tit, but it actually says Demon's Tilt. Um, all that sort of stuff. It's really cool. Living Orb, that's a that's a um, another physical game that I'm seeing for the Europe nominees. Some really good, and you're into adventure games. There's some really good adventure games. There's one interesting one for Europe that's called Forgotten Anne. I've seen whispers of this, but the art in it is fantastic. So yeah, that yeah. just draws me to it initially. Yeah, there's so much uh, just cool stuff in this in this list. I was looking at uh, what is it? Um, IO Interloper, mm -hmm. uh, for instance, which is like this hacking immersive sim that looks really really cool. Um, yeah, all sorts of stuff. Uh, Indicate is uh, is definitely uh, uh, one of these expos that really interests me. I hope to be able to go at some point. Kleptocrat looks really interesting to me. Right? That uh, it's like a it's like a poli it's like a political sim, but you're a dirty politi a politician, which is still a political sim, <laughs> uh, where you have to hide your dirty money. Interesting to me. But anyway, that is Indicate 2018. So I hope you uh, can sign up and go check it out. Because it's really fun. You might, if you're going to the one in the West, you might see Rev. And uh, say hi to him. Take a picture and that sort of stuff. It's cool. Um, next up. Close that. Scum. The game Scum. We're not doing a feature on it. Uh, just don't... I, I just don't want to. <laughs> um, not that it's a terrible game. It's just there's so many... I, I tend to shy away from uh, survival games. Survival crafting, that sort of stuff. Bit of a saturated market at the moment. Yeah, I just I, I stay. It's just so many between that and fucking royales. I, I like you know, it's just oh, so I'm tired of it. But anyway, that 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 doesn't mean scum is bad. Um, I've seen some gameplay and it does look pretty interesting. Scum is one of those. It's kind of a cross between survival sim and, and battle royale, to be honest. Um, but you play as an inmate who's dropped off and you have to fight to the death until you're the last one standing. All the meanwhile, you're also uh, surviving and crafting and that sort of stuff uh, for as long as you can in the game. However, the piece of news that we're covering in Scum uh, kind of is a, a topic that we bring up every so often and talk about is censorship. But at the same time, uh, you know, first of all, uh, we're talking about a private company. They can do what they want. I'll put that out there first. Second, maybe you uh, have a problem just because censorship is censorship. Who knows? But anyway, what happened is Scum, uh, the character uh, model that you have, um, has tattoos on his body because inmate or whatever. Inmates have to have tattoos, I guess. And on one of the tattoos is a uh, was a Nazi tattoo of the, uh, I think it's the Iron Cross with a skull on it, which I think was an SS thing. Um, I'm not sure. But they had it. On the, the, yeah, 1488 as they, well. They had it on the back of the neck there. 1488. What is, what is, is that a Nazi thing? Yeah, yeah. So it's the, the 14 uh, words is uh, we must secure the existence of our people in a future for white children. And then 88 is uh, the eighth letter of the alphabet twice. <clears throat> HH for Heil Hitler. Oh, well, shit. Uh, yeah, Aryan Brotherhood. Um, I, I personally. I get why people get upset because, especially nowadays. Um, however, he's a he's an inmate, and realistically, there are a lot of Aryan Brotherhood inmates, a lot of Nazi sympathizers in jail, and a lot of skinheads um, that are into that sort of thing. It it, it 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 it's something that happens. You know, they're not. It's not like the game devs are like, we enjoy Hitler. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> He was a swell guy. 
Um, I mean, it's it's the kind of thing where it's where it's like I mean, it it's actually a, you know I think part of a bigger discussion that's been going on for a longer time, uh, which is like does representing things in media and specifically video games have been targeted for this a lot. Uh, you know, does it does it make it happen in real life? Um, so like. You know, of course, like, does Grand Theft Auto, like, cause, uh, you know, crime? Is there a causal relationship between first-person shooters and people actually murdering people? I mean, the other day, um, I took my car and just ran down the sidewalk, and when everyone was dead, I went, got out and took their money. And then I climbed up on top of, right. a, of a building and, dry, and just jumped off of it just to see what would happen. Well, to my mind, that's you, you, you really hit the nail on the head as far as the absurdity of the argument. Like, if we're going to say that these, like, violent things are perpetuated by media representation, then we'd have to say the same thing about everything else. And to a certain extent, yes, okay, obviously our cultural, our worldview and everything is shaped by the media we consume. Media is incredibly powerful. Um, but at the same time, you know, I don't know that, you know, including a Nazi tattoo on a character you know, an Aryan Brotherhood character in a prison simulator uh, is necessarily, that's it. That's the keystone of the advancement of modern fascism. Like, they, they found it and they squashed it and, like, now the battle is won, <laughs> it's won or whatever. Um, on the other hand, you know, though, like, fuck Nazis. So, uh, you know, I, I, it's really a win-win situation for me, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, either, either censorship, uh, you know, is defeated or Nazis are sort of shat on. So yeah, I do investment. Like I get, I get the sensitivity, but again, the, the guy's a, the guy's a prisoner and it, it's, it's a thing that happens in prison. People get these tattoos and, and there are a bunch of racists in prison. Um, I mean, maybe give an option that if you really don't want it on your character to take it off. I mean, I, I I think there might even be a customization option to get that off. I'm not sure because I haven't played it, but uh, I don't know. It, it seems it seemed like a very a very visceral response to something that wasn't. It, it was very overblown. Um, you know, no I mean, one. It, it, also, this uh, this tactic just demonstrably doesn't work. Like, you know, the the Germany has had censorship on Nazi imagery since the end of World War II, basically. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and they still have, uh, you know, white supremacist movements in, in Germany. It, it, it's sort of a backwards and, and, and kind of naive and foolish argument to think that, uh, you know, censorship is a, is a solution to uh, political strife. I mean, you, just driving it underground doesn't actually get any thing done devolver digital the publisher of the game um very awesome indie game publisher by the way they're actually the ones that re uh had it removed um you know they they talked to the devs and you're like okay you need to remove this or we can't do this um and in their defense because i again i will say that i don't agree with i don't agree with this maybe it, again just make it an option and just leave it at that but in their defense because of su of the huge backlash they have to do what's safe for their company as much as they probably want to say, you know what, this is, it's, you know, this is just how it's the vision. It's not, it's not anything. Yeah. There's nothing notorious about it. It's just about realism. It's about the, you know, it's the developers, how they wanted it. But and those calls too are happening behind the curtain all the time with publishers. Yeah. I mean, uh, uh, not every every single you know nixing by a by an and and the, th the thing is is that it's not just about Tech Devolver, but Devolver okay. publishes a bunch of games. I'm sorry if I'm cutting you off because your 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 mic no, your good. mic cuts off and I think you're finished, but then you're not. Um, but uh, it's not just about Devolver or or uh, Crow Team, the, the people that made the game. It's not just about them, but Devolver, they publish a bunch of games. So if Devolver gets shit on, so do all the games underneath them. So they have to do what's right for everyone, even if they don't necessarily want to. But in this case, you know, I can't blame them for doing it. That's all I'm saying. But, uh, you know, that's a uh, uh, preface saying what's so funny to me is that the Aryan Brotherhood prison gang doesn't revolve around supremacy. Um, it's there, but not their sole purpose. There's an interesting documentary about the gang and what they do and don't do a reality stranger than fiction for sure. Um, I mean, I don't know a whole lot about the Aaron Brotherhood. I've never, I don't study that sort of stuff. I just know that it tends to be, uh, I mean, with the name Aryan Brotherhood, that makes like, it just comes off as so, thinking that yourself supreme as a white person because, you know, Aryan race, 
Um, but I, I, I'll take your word for it that that's not the case. I don't really know because I haven't done the research. So, um, anyway, enough about Nazis. Because fuck them. <laughs> Next up, prison architect. More about prisoners. <laughs> Less about Nazis. More about prisons. <laughs> Uh, so Prison Architect has recently added online multiplayer uh, as an opt-in alpha feature. So they're still, first of all, it's impressive that they're still updating Prison Architect. Um, it's, they've, they've done such a great job with this game. I love it. Um, but adding multiplayer to it, I don't know. I mean, I, I guess it can't be a bad thing, but like playing Prison Architect, and I don't know if you've ever played it, but playing Prison Architect does not seem like a multiplayer experience to me. I'm not, I, I don't fully, I mean, I don't really fully understand it. I've not played Prison Architect, but uh, like a sort of tycoon or, or like management style game like this, I definitely agree. It doesn't seem like it would lend itself to co-op play. I'm just trying to see like what the reasoning is behind this. I mean, other than the fact like, why not? I will say that... In this kind of game, it doesn't bother me so much, even though it's kind of weird um, to, in this particular genre. But adding multiplayer to everything just kind of drives me nuts nowadays. Because in this case, it's not so bad because they've done it after fully completing the game. But a lot of games now, they like have to push multiplayer out with it uh, before its release, and then it just it hurts. It hurts the the, whole, the game as a whole because they're putting so much resources into multiplayer and keeping servers up and all that sort of shit just bothers me. And maybe it's just because I'm I'm a fucking I don't know pleb or something like that. I don't I don't generally go for multiplayer in most games. Like I don't play Call of Duty and that sort of stuff. Like I enjoyed Call of Duty when it was a single player campaign. Um, and then I got away from that so and then I just stopped playing because I had no interest. But uh, maybe that's just me. Anyway uh, Prison Architect multiplayer is uh, is currently available for you to try. Again, it isn't technically that part of the game is in alpha, so expect there to be bugs and uh, not not full features as far as that goes. But um, you can download it right now for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Oh no, no, wait. Uh, just Windows and Mac. Linux uh, is coming out later, but it will be out soon. So there you go. Uh, anything else you'd like to... Oh, oh, I know. Here's something. I don't have a... I don't have... <coughs> uh, I don't have a, a bumper for this. And I don't know if I will make one. But we're trying a new thing out this week because it kind of did something similar last week uh, in an impromptu setting. But now that Ian's a uh, master developer <laughs> who's still oh, in yeah. school... Uh, Ken Levine, watch your ass. <laughs> Uh, he is, uh, we're, we're doing this little mini segment called the dev delve, uh, with Mr. Ian McCammon, who's going to be talking about various, uh, developer discussions. Cause I know we have a lot of developers listening to this podcast, um, and watching. So, uh, I'll let you take that away. All right. So yeah, this is, uh, dev delve and I'm Ian McCammon and, uh, I'm hoping, uh, Josh, that you will not stand at the sidelines and you know, jump in and, and talk to me and I can talk Not to you about all. this. Not at all. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm on my own. Good thing I have some note cards. Um, so today uh, I wanted to talk about, and again, let me just extend my apologies. My hardware is uh, not my <laughs> usual hardware, so if I cut out at all. That's why you tell the girls. tough shit. <laughs> it's the way it goes. Um, yeah, that's what I tell all the girls. Absolutely. Um... So today, uh, I was thinking that I would talk about an idea uh, that I've uh, written about before and talked about a lot uh, among uh, other devs and other designers and, and stuff like that. And uh, uh, that is, is the concept of uh, diegesis and how it fits into video games. So if you're not familiar with diegesis, there are uh, really two definitions. I'd like to point out that um, it sounds like you're saying diet Jesus, like Jesus diet light. Jesus. <laughs> Diet Jesus. I and mean, if you're not familiar with Diet Jesus, it's just like regular Jesus, except for less sugar. And not no caffeine. Fresca. Fresca. <laughs> or as I know it, Diet Jesus. LaCroix want to be. 
it's, it's ironic because I actually drink a lot more diet root beer than I do Fresca. I just happen to have Fresca tonight, <laughs> so I'm just plugging the shit out of it. Um, anyway, Diet Jesus, or Diet Jesus. Um, <laughs> from and... Roy, Diet Jesus. <laughs> with a with a with a hint of holy blood. <laughs> holy, holy, right, holy water flavored. <laughs> this this leads to interesting. Can you have a priest bless Lacroix? Does that does that work? And then can you use can, that oh, Lacroix to fight vampires? Lacroix, call me on this shit right here, right now. I'm. This is my idea. What's up, Doctor Bronny? This is my idea. But you can call me and we'll work something out. Have holy water flavored LaCroix and have something set up in a can where when you open the can it goes oh my god I'm guaranteeing you that people will buy the shit out of that guarantee vampire hunters everywhere will be buying it by the case if you can set up like an LED light in the bottom of it where it shines light out of it boom boom it's holy water you just literally imbue it with the light of Christ I'm telling you People will buy it. Call me. We'll, we'll, we'll work something out. <laughs> I'm sorry. I fucked up. Your okay. no, 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 no. You're absolutely fine. This is great. Killing time. Filling time. Yes. That's a secret. Uh, adding gameplay hours by padding your content. We'll get to that later. That's an advanced <laughs> technique. <laughs> padding content and then locking the good stuff behind paywall. Right. I'm looking at you, Hideo Kojima, with your temperature key card puzzle in Metal Gear Solid 1. <laughs> Oh, what? You know, walk back and forth across Are you saying the Hideo Kojima is... three times? Don't mind if I do. Are you saying Hideo Kojima is not infallible? I might I might be saying that. I'm sorry. Certainly certainly 1997 game design. That's how you get infallible. Speaking of speaking of Diet Jesus, that's how you get crucified in yeah, the video game industry. You don't you don't fuck with Hideo Kojima. Look what um, happened to look what happened to Konami. Doesn't <laughs> That is true. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good point anyway diet jesus two uh two de- two definitions uh one uh is uh from literature and uh it is uh there are two terms in literature there's mimesis and diet jesus uh mimesis is telling a story through performing through imitating uh so things like acting are mimetic um whereas diet jesus is narrated storytelling uh, conveyed by a third party. Um, and then in film, diegesis uh, is contrasted with extra diegesis, and it has to do with what exists in the world of the film and what exists in the world of the viewer. So the, the common example is music. Um, you know, music that is actually being played by a character. Uh, so for instance, um, M- uh, American Psycho, when he plays, uh, you know, Huey Lewis in the news on his stereo before he axes Jared Leto, uh, that's diegetic music. That was it actually. Wait, exists. that was Jared Leto. Uh, isn't isn't it Jared Leto who plays? Uh, I don't think so. With that character. I mean, American Psycho's old. That was in the nineties, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I don't I, I think Jared Leto wasn't in in the film acting back then, was he? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it, it's somebody though. Somebody though plays um, Paul. Okay. Uh, anyway, what did you say Paul. He, he acts as the guy, um, uh, he, uh, whoever he may be. It is Jared uh, Leto, according to prep. Sure. Nice. Holy shit. Damn. Putting that film education to good use. Um, so yes, uh, before he acts as young Jared Leto, he plays Huey Lewis in the news on the stereo. That music is diegetic. Patrick himself can hear it. The characters can hear it. They can talk about it. Um, but the score of the film that's played by the orchestra is usually, you know, unless you're being very experimental, uh, extra diegetic. It exists only in the realm of the viewer who is actually experiencing the film. Um, so when we talk about diegesis in video games, I would actually argue that uh, video games are uniquely positioned to incorporate sort of both of those uh, definitions into a into a broader uh, or not even broader well yeah broader and and sort of unique definition um, and to exemplify this I will ask you Josh this question in Starcraft who are you playing as uh, the tactician 
Right, exactly. You're not actually playing as any one of these specific characters. You're playing uh, yourself, arguably technically. as a god. Yeah, arguably as yourself. But you like are actually <laughs> present in like you know telecommunications between various characters, and you you have this user interface that implies that you're actually in a place in the world. Now, this is strictly mechanical. It's sort of it's sort of necessitated by the mechanics of a of a real time strategy game. But that doesn't mean that you can't play around with that and um when i was first writing about this there were there were two examples that i use I, I think they're a bit outdated now but i'm going to talk about them anyway um because i didn't have time to think up a better more modern example <laughs> um although you know in stuck in 1997 Ko kojima does this a lot actually but he doesn't count because he's not an indie developer so we're not going to talk well about he is it. now well, kind well, of. Well, I mean, kind of. Sony, I mean, I guess if you're just a, an independent contractor for Sony, <laughs> you're technically <laughs> an, in, an indie developer. Um, but yeah, so he, he does this all the time. But the, the, the examples that I, I was uh, using when I was first talking about this um, were, were uh, there's one game called Sunset. I don't know if anybody remembers this. They, they, Sunset was a, a game that was made by a, an art house developer called Tale of Tales. Um, they no longer make games. They now are focused on doing, I think, virtual reality art installations because they uh, they weren't very commercially successful. And then they sort of threw a temper tantrum uh, online and blamed players for the fact that they weren't successful. Oh, they did a Phil Fish. Of, yeah, and then uh, but yeah, and then they sort of they so they pulled a Phil Fish and then sort of retreated into the fine art uh, <laughs> universe. Um, but. Uh, it's a shame because I actually think that, that their games were quite good and it's a shame that they didn't achieve enough commercial success to continue making them. They also made a game called The Path, which is a really cool take on, on Little Red Riding Hood. Um, but Sunset was really interesting because uh, it operated on two levels narratively. Uh, the basic premise was that you played this uh, young woman, she's an American expatriate, um, who had basically uh, moved to this uh, uh, Banana Republic, uh, sort of based on a number of places, uh, particularly Cuba, though, in the like late years of the American-backed regime. Um, and uh, so she moves to this place and she becomes uh, a housekeeper for this, uh, you know, wealthy uh, art dealer, as I recall. Um, and so much of the gameplay involves these half an hour segments where you're given a list of chores and free reign of, of this guy's penthouse apartment and you can do the chores or you can not do the chores but either way you can explore the environment and you learn things about this character ortega the art dealer and his involvement in this uh in financing this sort of left-wing revolution which ultimately ends in failure um the other uh, and, and so you, you glean story that way. And that's sort of the mimetic way. You're actually walking through the world. You're, you're telling a story through action. You're interacting with things. You're like making the, little... Like Gone Home type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Gone, and Gone Home does this to a certain extent as well. But, but what makes um, Sunset interesting in this specific uh, context is that it has this other storytelling example where... Um, you somewhere in the environment there's this easy chair it's ortega's easy chair and it, it actually moves around the apartment over the course of the game um which has some interesting storytelling like uh, passive storytelling in itself but when you sit in this chair um the the main character uh of sunset angela will begin writing in her diary and in this way, you learn a huge amount about her backstory and what she's doing in between these like half an hour segments where you play as her in her capacity as a maid. Um, and it's directly narrated to the player. There's sort of text that appears on the screen. Um, this is a really simple example, but but it, it demonstrates sort of how side by side you can have these two, t two storytelling techniques, one that is direct on the part of the player and the other uh, that is uh, told by, uh, you know, a narrator. Um, so, so now that those sort of definitions are in place, I would point to another uh, game that goes one step further and really blends those together. Um, do you remember, Josh, did you ever play a game called The Moon Sliver? I believe it was designed by a gentleman named David Zemansky. 
No. Uh, who also did The Music Machine and A Wolf in Autumn, these sort of small Unity uh, single-player experiences. How recent was that? Oh, I would say The Moon Sliver probably came out in 2014. Um, and A Wolf in Autumn was probably more recent, maybe 2016, 2017. A Wolf in Autumn sounds familiar to me, but I did not play The Moon Sliver. Yeah, so, so uh, he's really cool, and he has uh, uh, some really unique storytelling techniques. He's also a world-class creep, if his creative output is anything to go <laughs> by, um, which makes him okay in my book. Um, but uh, yeah, so he, he writes these sort of dark stories, and, and the Moon Sliver is particularly interesting because um, you sort of, uh, you're placed on this island. You're not told very much. Um, there's been some sort of uh, apocalyptic cataclysm. And, uh, and now you're on this island uh, where once there were survivors, but they're, they're all gone now. And you sort of explore the remains of their, their sort of ramshackle settlement, and you're told that at, at, at dusk you should go to the mountain and, and go, go into this doorway in the mountain. Um, it's really interesting because as you wander around the island, uh, text appears on the screen that is, is snippets of a, of a short story. But, and uh, you can also read diaries as well, but the primary uh, you know, story thread is conveyed through these little snippets um, that appear just in screen space as, you're, as you walk into locations and then fade away as you move away from them. Um, the most interesting thing is that the player character in this game actually exists both diegetically and extra diegetically. Um, so, on the one hand, you are just you. You are just the player. You're this sort of disembodied consciousness who's moving through this environment and getting these snippets of story. Um, but it's also implied that you might be actually one of these characters. That so you're it's here. like, so it's kind of like an out-of-body of experience for the character, and you just happen to be that separate, absolutely astral pro projection of that, of that. And and it's left sort of ambiguous as to which character you might be. There's there there are hints that you could be, as I recall, two or three different characters. Um, and it's hard to pin down exactly who you are because it's hard to pin down exactly, you know, who's still alive as of the latest recorded piece of story that you encounter, and uh, you know who's died and what's happened to everybody. Um, and so it, it it plays with this in a really interesting way. Um, and I just found that to be to be really fascinating. And then uh, the the third example that I would list, uh, which I hadn't really thought about the first time that I that I wrote about this concept, um, has any? I wonder if anybody has ever played Deadly Premonition. Um, I have not played it, but I I've seen oh, you, plenty of it. Plenty you of know it. of it. Yeah, you know it's yes. Yeah. So, so what you probably know is that it is a that's ridiculous. Some nut, that is some nutso shit right there. Highly, highly disjointed, um, tone deaf uh, attempt at a survival horror game. Um, what you may not know is that it has possibly one of the greatest stories ever told. <laughs> it's it's uh, its narrative is. Strange you heard it right here debate. first, folks. In the game, Riot review of Deadly Premonition, one of the greatest stories ever told, and Actually, it's not ironic. I, I have to give credit to, I believe it was Jim Sterling who gave it a ten out of ten in his review for Destructoid. Um, well, I, and... I, I got to say, there are things to, to compare it to another another medium. Uh, Shark Attack Three Megalodon would give I would give a legitimate 10 out of 10 even if they weren't trying for the reasons that I was giving it a 10 out of 10 <laughs> so I will I will put that out there that I could see that I could see that being legitimate well I will I will also say that um uh you know just to push it one step further I've not seen Shark Attack 3 Megalodon so for fuck's actually... sake man next time that you and I hang out we'll watch we're it. watching that shit I'm telling you right now sounds good to me I, I'm fuck. down I've never um, laughed harder at any movie in my life. I see now. Now, Shark Attack Three Megalodon may have, uh, you know, some sort of deep substance to it underneath the "so bad it's good" element, and certainly, Deadly Premonition has a lot of "so bad it's good" elements to it. Um, but it actually has one element that is legitimately good in its own right, and that is its main character, uh, who is a 
an FBI agent named Francis York Morgan, <laughs> who is absolutely hilarious and deeply disturbed. He displays a, a sort of, um, it's sort of un unclear, uh, some sort of schizotypal or disassociative uh, symptoms um, uh, in which he, he has this sort of imaginary friend that he talks to named, named Zach. Um, oh, yeah, 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 okay. Yeah. But here's the fascinating turn. After playing this game for about an hour and a half to two hours, uh, I realized that so there are these extended first of all uh yeah york's always sort of talking to zach that's i will say he, the, the cutscenes, the cutscenes in this game are just oh mwah, just beautiful <laughs> i fucking oh, love them the music the music too it really sells it the, there's a there's one particular song about whistle that, that involves a, a lot of whistling that uh, is played under scenes that definitely don't call for that tone <laughs> um but yeah, so, so, so the really fascinating move, uh, and what I have to hand it to Swery65, the mysterious developer, for doing this, is that, um, first of all, uh, you know, York talks to Zach as a means of exposition. Um, so instead of just sort of talking to the player, he, he describes his surroundings and his feelings about his surroundings to, to Zach, his imaginary friend, except that you realize at this sort of, or I realize at this sort of crucial moment, that he was talking to me, he was talking to the player, that I wasn't actually playing as Francis. I was playing as the voice in his head that was telling him where to go. And the moment that I realized this is because there are these extended driving sequences during which uh, York will talk about everything from his love of old movies to his love of 80s punk rock music uh, to whatever, just these, these sort of long things. And these are sort of as you're on your way to missions in these open world, uh, in this open world survival horror game. But if you stop and go to like do something else, uh, maybe an item in a field catches your eye as you're on your way to your next objective. Francis will say something like, you know, oh, well, you know, we have to be somewhere, but I'm sure you know what you're doing, Zach. And then I realized that I was not actually playing as this character, but I was actually playing as his sort of dissociated personality. I like how, and, I like how Deadly Premonition is so good that it gave you an identity crisis playing this game. It, it literally did. And, I mean, I mean uh, from a narrative perspective, like, can you... Can you get any better as far as conveying a character through, uh, you know, through a medium, uh, especially an interactive did medium? Did you ever see? Uh, did you ever see Face Off? Yeah, yeah, of course. You're like you're like Nicolas Cage when he's looking in the mirror, like I'm me. <laughs> Dude, but instead you're like that I'm Zach. Oh, um, I'm Zach. It, it gets you. I don't want to spoil it for anyone because I hope that anyone who hasn't played it will take my heartfelt recommendation and go out and knuckle through the weirdness and really play this game and get and get lost in it for, for a few hours so that you can experience this incredible turn at the end where the fact that you are Zach takes on this massive significance in York's character development. Um, See, it, I, it's, I'd look it's at it so I, much better than it has any right to be. It, it like <laughs> it like should be so much stupider and yet it somehow transcends and achieves. I have this. I have this habit of, I have this habit of taking things like that, that, you know, taking the one good thing out of this game, and and then still turning it into shit. Because my <laughs> idea from once I would find that out, I'd be like, man, I'm like a motherfucking ghost. I can fucking fuck with this guy. I can haunt him. <laughs> I can make him do some stupid shit. <laughs> well, the, for the fortunate thing is that. Um, in this open world survival horror, there's plenty of stupid <laughs> shit to do. <laughs> open world. So uh, it's it's yeah it's it's open world and it's obscenely open world. It's like With so the, the open driving world the driving. Holy shit! It's bad. It's it's really bad. That was painful. But, but again, like it's a, it's a sum is greater you know whole is greater than the sum of its parts uh, sort of thing. And I, I definitely am happy. Also. They actually remastered it and released a remastered version of it, I think, for PS3 and possibly for PC you know, as well. You know, what's um, My friend says it plays much better. You know what's weird? I'm thinking about it now. I wonder if 
horror games now have taken inspiration from that, even though it's considered a shitty game overall in a good way. Uh, I wonder if, because like when you look at like the Evil Within, yeah, and the Evil Within Two is kind of open worldish. It kind of reminds me now that I'm thinking about it uh, of Deadly Premonition in that way. Yeah, I. I mean, I have no doubt that, that it was influential in some ways. I, I don't think that you can do what it was trying to do as early as it was trying to do it and not be somewhat influential. Tur- in turns out Deadly Premonition was a masterpiece. It was just way ahead of its time. I, I do. I, you know, it, I think that may be the case. It also may be the only masterpiece that Swery had in him because I sure didn't like uh, Dark Dreams Don't Die anywhere near as much as I liked. Was that uh, him? Premonition. That was him. Yeah, I uh, I actually kind of wanted to play that. It. It's it's zany. It's zany, and and there is. Well, I thought that was closer to an adventure game. Yeah, kind of. It's pretty psychedelic, even in its format. It's like hard for me to exactly. Like I thought it was like I thought it was like closer to um, like a Telltale's game or or um, rest in peace by the way, um, or. Uh, the, the fucking other one that Ubisoft or excuse me Ubisoft uh, <laughs> came out with I can't think of the name of for whatever reason uh, the Chloe character the time tra- uh, you know the time traveling anyway doesn't matter uh, well that was certainly an interesting thing uh, with um, my nieces my nieces and die Jesus <laughs> <laughs> well, let me uh, let me just cap it off by saying that that my goal here is to sort of draw attention to this uh, unique aspect of the interactive medium that you can really play with the positioning of the player uh, and and where they fit into the world. Um, we have this sort of there's this mantra that we're constantly being told that oh well, like be as immersive as possible. I challenge any dev to not just blindly take that rule, but to actually manipulate immer- uh, you know, immersion intentionally to create uh, new perspectives within, a, within an interactive experience. That's how I'd close that. There you go. Master game developer Ian McCammett with his very first dev delve on Indie Game Riot. Uh, maybe we'll create a bumper for that. Maybe not. I don't know yet. It's, still, it's kind of a mini segment, kind of like how we do our, our discussion points or whatever. But anyway... That has been that, and we'll uh, look forward to the next one next week. And uh, you know what we're looking forward to now? Oh, I do. Let me let me just jump over to my correct prompter here and say that we're going to be starting some riots. Yes, starting the riot. Eventually, I'll memorize this shit. Huh? This week. On Starting of the Riot, the very first game we're going to be talking about today is uh, Graveyard Keeper by Lazy Bear Games. So, first of all, if Lazy Bear Games sounds familiar to you, uh, especially if you are a longer longer time um, in a game riot watcher and or listener, is because we covered one of their games before, um, uh, Punch Club, which uh, was really good game. A little bit, uh, it was a little bit, what's the word I'm trying to think of? A little too micromanagey for me, and, 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 and I'm not going to cover that game because that's not the game we're talking about. But because it was like a, um, it was a boxing simulator where you had to manage certain resources like energy and time, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, you had to feed them and all that sort of stuff, sleep. So, um, but it was a good game overall. This game kind of stays within a similar genre, but uh, more open and much larger scale and deeper. Um, this is called Graveyard Keeper, where you are this guy who gets hit by a car in the beginning, uh, and you wake up to find yourself the graveyard keeper of a graveyard in a, like, medieval-looking town. And you're like, what the fuck? And there's this disembodied skull that talks to you, there's a priest that's, like, your boss, there's a donkey that talks to you who delivers dead bodies to you, uh, on occasion, and, uh, your job is to take them into your little graveyard keeper cave, and uh, chop them up if you need to or want to mm-hmm. to uh, either use to research things or sell to the tavern as meat. <laughs> um, 
and uh, you know get money that way. And then eventually, you know, the overall goal is to figure out like why you're there and how to get back home uh, to your to your love. So. The biggest comparison, Graveyard Keeper, uh, that I can make with Graveyard Keeper is actually Stardew Valley, believe it or not. Because a lot of the mechanics kind of remind you of that, um, where you have a limited amount of time throughout the day to do things. Um, you have a certain amount of energy to do things, and it, you know you kind of have to plan out your day. Or in this case, you actually, certain things only happen certain days of the week. So, like, like the bishop who takes care of, uh, who's basically your boss... If you need to talk to him for or get something from him for whatever reason or complete a mission for him or quest, I should say, um, he's only going to be there on. It's not like Monday through Thursday; they have like symbols for the days of the week instead. But for for our intent and purposes, um, we'll just say like he's there every Sunday, so that's the only day you can go see him, and you have to kind of plan out for that. There's also upgrading and crafting, so you can upgrade your area where you can chop up. Uh, bodies or you can upgrade your your house where you can cook or you can upgrade like out in your yard where you can uh you know create different like more advanced uh materials to to craft with um you can craft tools much like in um i, I guess technically you can't really craft tools in stardew valley but the point is you can upgrade them um in stardew valley uh and uh, you're taking care of different things like you you even have like a farm plot area where you can get ingredients from um i will say that this game is a much much slower burn than stardew valley as far as like progress goes it's and i think that partially because of the the week system where they have you know only certain days a week you can do things but also some of the some of the um missions especially the ones that you get in the beginning the quests that you get tend to be kind of difficult when you're starting out because it like calls for a lot of a certain material that you can't get without uh, there's like a research tree as well so you can't get with uh you can't get this material without researching this thing and once you research it you still have to have like a, an upgraded workbench which you know requires other materials that you need to research for that sort of thing so it takes forever to get you know to the point where you're completing certain quests um preventing too much spoilage but one of the missions that you get uh with that bishop um in this graveyard that you're currently seeing in the in the gameplay is you know you have to fix up the graveyard to a certain uh point amount you know to determine like the niceness of your graveyard you know you have to fix up the graves you have to make them nice decorate them etc etc and to do that you have to get these like repair kits uh you know you get a few in the beginning for free but you have to get more and God forbid you use them like the wrong way or don't even realize that you need to you know, use them because that's what I did, which makes it take even longer because then you have to create more repair kits. But to create more repair kits, you need these different materials. And to get those materials, you need upgraded tools. To get the upgraded tools, you need upgraded workbench. To get the upgraded workbench, you need different materials. And you need to go out and collect that sort of, it's, it's, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and it took me forever to complete that quest. And once you complete that quest, it opens up a whole new fucking part of the game where you ha you end up becoming the goddamn, excuse my blasphemy, but the goddamn priest of the church in this graveyard <laughs> where you every Sunday, you literally have to come to the church every Sunday to give a sermon to the people and you have to make it good or else you're fucked and you don't get the shit that you need because the people in the sermon give you money and a different, a certain kind of research currency that to, 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 so you can chop up different parts of the body and do more research that way. And it's just, it's, it's incredibly deep, but there is so much that it's like, Oh my, it's a little overwhelming and, and it takes forever to get through it. But I will say it's very, very fun and, and uh, addicting much like Stardew Valley is, uh, I won't compare it in quality to Stardew Valley, just in the sense that, you know, similar game mechanics, um, because it's not really fair to, to compare it to quality of, of Stardew Valley since they are two different, um, outside of some basic mechanics, it's, they're pretty much two different games, so it's not really fair to compare them, but you said you, you checked it out a little bit as well? Just a little bit, yeah, but I, uh, the impression I got was much, much the same as yours. It also seemed, uh, that, that you could, uh, really, uh, you know, affect the the sort of uh, I don't know what you call it uh, the ecosystem of the town, so to speak. I mean, you can you can do all sorts of weird stuff that that affects the uh, 
uh, you know, food and water and, and the internal workings of the little town that oh, you're, yeah. you're involved well, like, with. Which like is I said, very, you can very... sell the meat to the tavern. Yeah. But, but again, to sell the meat to the tavern, you need to get a stamp from the, from some official. And to get the stamp from an official, you have to complete a quest for them, which involves you getting a certain amount of <laughs> materials to do something to get the quest, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also, an interesting thing, too, is that... Um, the bodies that you get, if they happen to be shitheads in life, and you chop them apart for whatever reason, it like turns it, to, it like lowers the quality of your graveyard if you bury shitty people in your graveyard. Uh, that's interesting. So, but in order to get rid of them, um, you can build an incinerator, which takes for fucking ever to build because it needs all the shit, and I won't go into that whole thing. But the other thing that you can do, which you might get in trouble for in a game, and also you mentioned. The reason I bring this up is because you mentioned like the water quality and all that sort of stuff. Right. You can dump the bodies in the river and just let them right. float downstream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you can play this beautiful. game like an asshole if you want to. It seems deep. It seems you know dense with content. So uh, it does seem like it could be a little overwhelming. But you know, some people, some people like that. Some people play Dwarf Fortress. Mm. Some <laughs> people do play Dwarf Fortress. Yes. <laughs> I heard. I heard rumors. I've never <laughs> seen it myself, but yeah. So I, it's a uh, it's a lot. It's a lot to take in, but I really enjoy it. And and again with the pixel art, um, Lazy Bear Games has a has a good uh, reputation with their pixel art. It's always pretty detailed and everything like Perhaps that. Perhaps is no die of Jesus in in Graveyard Keeper, but I would I would kind of argue that in a way the the player character is die of Jesus. <laughs> In, in a way, he did raise from at, the dead. At the, yes. very, at the very least, die at Lazarus. Yeah, he raised he raised from the dead, uh, and probably will go to hell. Um, I don't know if he'll come back from that like Jesus did, but um, you know, hey. <laughs> so uh, comparative comparative theology. This is out of my wheelhouse. I I have some like some minor grape, gra uh, gra grapes 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 <laughs> gripes is what I'm trying minor to say. Grapes. Um, I have some is minor grapes. Grape a LaCroix flavor? Because it probably <laughs> should be. LaCroix. Minor if you drink, grape. If you drink LaCroix, it probably means you're smuggling minor grapes. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't, I, that joke made more sense in my mind. Anyway. I don't know. Well, I don't know the, uh, are you familiar with the term uh, smuggling plums? Which I believe. Well, I... I <laughs> Smuggling grapes, I got that from like a movie or something like that where uh, right. someone was wearing like too tight of pants and saying, man, it looks like you're yeah, smuggling yeah, grapes. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. I mean, that's the, that's the terminology I'm familiar with. So I picked up on it. Don't worry. All even right. if nobody else did. Thank you. Um, some, some minor grapes. So like uh, besides the fact that it takes forever to get through everything and, and it's kind of it seems a little imbalanced for some of the quests that you get in the beginning, uh, I will say that the map it's very hard to tell where you need to go um because there's a lot of areas that are kind of like walled off for the most part um with like a little section where you can walk through um and the map is not one for one it just kind of gives you this general idea of where things are so there's a quest where you have to go meet this guy at a lighthouse and i had no fucking idea where the lighthouse was at all um and it took i don't know it I could have finished that probably pretty early on in the game, but it took me longer than it took me to get the fucking church open to find the lighthouse because I it was like down in like the far south right corner, uh, southeast corner of the map, and I thought it was you know upwards along the coast in the top like north northeast, yeah east northeast area of the map, and it, it, I don't know I I wandered around a long time, so that's like a minor grape outside of the uh, the quest balancing, but. Overall, a uh, very high-quality game. Um, do you have any last words for, for Graveyard Keeper? Nope. <laughs> Not in the least. Well, fine then. Uh, we're back, and uh, we're going to leave for just a few seconds for those of you watching the recorded version anyway, because uh, we're going to get our little bit of peep show on. Hmm. Please give all your attention to Early Access.
this week on Peep Show, we're talking about the universe, the universe sim. sim. It's actually the universe sim. The universe the, sim. The, or as we Ubisofters like to say, the universe sim. <laughs> <laughs> by, by Crytivo or Crytivo. I don't fucking know anymore. I'm tired. Um, anyway, the universe sim is a uh, sim game, obviously. Uh, where you are basically, it's it's more of a god sim than anything, where you're basically in control of the world and things that get built on it and then what happens with the civilization that's on the world. And uh, it's really, um, I think I think it takes god sim and, and kind of lets you mix in a little bit of a, I don't want to say the sims into it, because it's not as micromanaging as that, but... It, do you remember? Okay, so like, it's like if you took. I'm trying to find. There's some really bad comparisons popping into my head, but I can't help but think of it. So if you took Spore, and like mm-hmm. mashed it into one game instead of like, splitting it up into like a whole bunch of different parts, like Spore did, it's kind of like that. So I did. I got yeah. I got some Spore vibes. I also um, sort of got uh, a little bit of like uh, like black and white vibes as well and, yeah black and also and white uh, mm-hmm. uh like do you remember sim earth from like way back like the no. 90s that is that i did not know <laughs> yeah it was like installed on like a computer that was somewhere in my periphery when i was very young um this seems sort of like the evolution of sim earth it was one of the one of the will right you know sim sim games i believe you i just uh, i've not played that um but yeah, basically you're taking the world and you can do what you want with it, but uh, you're also managing uh, the growing civilization on this planet from, you know, from cave people, Neanderthals or whatever, to, uh, you know, a futuristic space civilization, spacefaring civilization. Um, and throughout the whole thing, you got to uh, kind of lead them through bullshit, you know, whether it be natural disasters or, you know, any other problems that... that uh, I don't know if they're actually called humans in the game, but you know that sort of thing that they may f- those sorts of things they may face as their civilization grows, um, and you you it's your job to to lead them either towards victory or lead them astray if you're an asshole, which you know we all are in a little bit of way. <laughs> um, so as because it's a god sim, you also like I said you can be an asshole. Um, you can, besides just interacting with civilization and the things on the planet, but you can also create the disasters. Um, you can launch, just randomly launch things into space. Uh, you know, you it, it gives like you people. A, yeah, you can just fling them into space. Fuck uh, yeah, as God is wont to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> that mechanic alone is like uh, it's, it's worth it. It's like uh, like Kerbal Space Program, except minus all the annoying engineering aspects, just fucking toss your people up into space. And because and you brought up like those those classic uh, sim games, those God Sims, and and it they do take a lot of inspiration from those. They don't name any, but it says that they they um, bring back a lot of features that you that you know from classic God games, and then just bring in a, a more modernized uh, feel and, and and new ideas to it. Um, and obviously, you know, updated visuals and all this sort of stuff. I will say the visuals in this game, they're, they're simplistic. I kind of wish they were a little bit more detailed, but I mean, I think in this game it's more important that you get the, uh, uh, gameplay design and and mechanics. Get their sales numbers, then you can, you know, put the better graphics in the remastered version. Yeah. Well, I, I, it's not that the graphics are bad. They purposely went with this like simplistic art style. Of the character, like the characters are facelets, so like kind of um, prison architect ish, where it's just like detached heads and and hands from like these oblong bodies, and they're kind of um, they're faceless and and they're a little bit uh, poly- polygonal. Is that is that the word polygonal? Polygonal? Yeah. I don't know. I'm um, polygonous. I only only get married to polygons. Well. It, I'll see myself out. <laughs> Good one. <laughs> uh, Rev Rev takes offense. He will. Uh, he'll he'll send you a, some shit in the mail. Um, what? He's a, he's opposed to me marrying three D characters. No, but he's like a legit like poly. What do you call himself? Hey, well, he 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 was for a while there married to a guy and a, and a woman. 
Um, and I forget what he called himself because of that, but he's like legit and does that. So he might uh, punch you in the throat. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't, I was, I, uh, I just want to marry my 3D characters. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not trying to shit on anybody's parade. No, I know? think. Look at me, I'm, polyamory. I'm, I'm kidding. I'm I don't think he gives just, a damn. <laughs> uh, just let me, let me marry my 3D characters. I just want to fuck the pixels out of them. I mean, um, shit, you know. Isn't that why we play games in real, like, deep down, Dr. Freud? Uh, by the way, the plants that you get, I believe, are procedural, so you can play different games and get different uh, issues with your planet. So you can get a planet that ha- that you know that's pretty calm and, and you know, don't have a lot of issues, but you can also get a planet that has... Um, that's like really barren or has like a lot of like molten eruptions or things like that. So, uh, you know, different gameplays. It's, 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 there's, uh, replay value is the word I'm trying to find here. Um, and again, we, we kind of talked about it with Rimworld earlier during the news segment, how like that procedural storytelling. And it's kind of like that with this game, uh, where you're, because of the different gameplay, you, you know, whatever happens to your, whatever choices you make and whatever events happen to your civilization kind of creates this unique story every time you play, which I think is pretty cool too. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and then kind of back to the spore thing is that the wildlife is not necessarily uh, traditional all the time. You can find some interesting shit crawling across the planet. Um, it's just a lot of really good stuff. A lot of, a lot of cool... Um, features that they added into this game just all in one wrapped into a little planet sized ball that you can control and do whatever you want with um, and then you can make changes along the way it's just they, 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 they thought of a lot I'm really impressed and again this is actually only an early access game um, it is it is early development so they're just going to keep adding more uh, and that was actually added in early access back on August 30th it just we took a while to, to get to it <laughs> Um, so, uh, any other thoughts on the universe? It, it looks really cool. You know, I, uh, I mentioned, um, you know, black and white. I don't know how, how much of that is just sort of a surface, sort of superficial similarity from what I, I've seen of the game. But um, the concept behind that game was, was so good. And yet, uh, you know, I think it, it just wasn't delivered on. So, I, you know, I, I, I like the idea of, uh, you know, refining the uh you know the god sim uh you know genre for the the modern era uh, so yeah that's I'd looks cool to me i'd like to point out that the current gameplay is showing two cave people fucking uh inside of a cave hearts spraying out of it and then them walking out with a toddler good yes so, so there's that for you just like real life that's how it happened to me <laughs> went into a cave came out with a toddler <laughs> uh, well, speaking of things that are irrelevant to mobile games, you know what's coming up next? Uh, going, going mobile. Yes, going mobile. This is, a, this is a relevant transition. There are buns in the oven and whatnot. What? Yeah, you, know, you could have made it like a like a bun in the oven joke or something. Uh, what does that have to do with mobile games? It does. It is. Well, it has to do with with uh, pregnancy and and like sizzle and stew. I don't know. Oh, I, guess, yeah. I see where the stretch is. Okay. Yeah, that, well, it's it's pretty stretchy. It's pretty stretchy. I, I don't know if it's. I really, mean, been labored in this, this wouldn't point be in the game riot. Starts. It wouldn't be in the game riot without a shitty segue. So, I mean, <laughs> thank you for adding to that. Hey, sometimes sometimes your segues are eerily eerily on point. <laughs> <laughs> They're on accident if they are. <laughs> that's, that's, that's all the better. Anyway, going mobile. Oh. Huh? <gasps> this week on Going Mobile, we're talking about Sizzle and Stew by Cow Cow Cowley Owl. Cali Owl, I think. Say that 153 times fast. Cali Owl, Cali Owl, Cali Owl, Cali Owl. I win. Close enough. I win. Uh, so, so Sizzle and Stew is actually a two-player cooking game that you can play on your mobile device um, where you are a sloth and a llama inside of a kitchen 
and uh, you're making food, but the whole point of it is to uh, make it, in, uh, the, the entertainment factor is that you can just make fucking mess out of everything that you do, um, and just kind of throw things around. I think there's a, there's a whole physics thing to it, where you're just kind of uh, stretching arms around, grabbing stuff, and just flinging ingredients all over the place, so if you're trying to dump ketchup on something, you know, it's kind of, if you hold it upside down, it's kind of just going everywhere until you put it down, and that sort of thing. Uh, it's really a simple... It's really a simple, simple game that is all about how much fun you want to have with it. You know what I mean? They let you do whatever with the food, and, and you have um, objectives uh, where you have to, you know, you, you have to do certain things. So, like, uh, ouch. You know, it says, like, make a mess, uh, eat in style, or um, just create whatever you want to out of certain ingredients. Um, or you can just fuck around and stick your donut in a washing machine, for instance. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I'm not sure. The only thing I'm not too sure about is the fact that the two-player is on, you can do in, like, split-screen mode. And on a phone, I just feel like that's a bit much. Like, you remember, like, on the old, like, two, two TVs where, you know, like, the little box TVs where you're trying to play, like, four-screen Four, oh, four yeah, split screen, and you're like, Joel and I are just talking about my childhood right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, squinting I, at the like horrible low resolution. I wonder why like, I have glasses now. So, uh, I mean, I guess maybe for us, because we we kind of did that, but everyone's spoiled nowadays with these big ass screens, and sure. most most games aren't even split screen anymore because it's because of the internet. So, but. Uh, the, no, there, do you, there do you have to play split screen, or can you do it by sort of uh, connecting your phones? Uh, or is uh, it only split screen? From what I understand, it is split screen only, as far as I can see. That is um, an interesting choice. Yeah. Um, and I think the reason they went with that is so that you don't have to be connected to the internet or anything like that. You can right. play it wherever you want, as long as someone else is with you. Yeah, um, I guess on a tablet... It's kind of cool too, is that there's no app, there's no in-app purchases or like microtransactions, um, and part of that is because they want to make it. They did want to make this family friendly, so if kids wanted to play it, which, which by the way, if you have kids, this is a really cool game too. Um, completely wholesome, make it they make a mess and have fun and cook or whatever. My my daughter loves this um, sort of thing. So, uh, but then you know they might they don't accidentally you know go purchase some hundred dollar microtransaction package. <laughs> that you can charge on your cell phone bill, so that's kind of nice. Um, this is also a game where there's a lot of like uh, hidden things in the in, in the game where you can uh, combine different things and just kind of surprise you made a new thing, that sort of thing where you're kind of unlocking stuff, new ingredients and costumes for your characters that uh, as you play. Um, just a really fun, simple game all around. I, I gotta say. Um, and like I said, they kind of like they're they're pointing it towards kids and family friendly. But I mean, I personally really enjoy it just myself. It's just yeah, fun, yeah. To, fun to turn your brain off and just fuck around. Fun's fun, right? Yeah, exactly. And then you get to eat your food too, as a sloth. <laughs> Would you be the sloth or a llama? Oh man, you know I don't know. It's the, it's the kind of situation where you gotta like you gotta try out each character, figure out who jives with your mindset. Who am so, I? Like another Tekken character, Sizzle and Stew, creating another uh, identity crisis for Ian. Am I a? Slot? It's me. I'm just you know that's the thing. And I'm you just can like, play one player by the way. I should point that out. Just two inside of the game. That's my problem. <laughs> What's the narrative direction? It all goes back to, to Mass Effect. I, I you know, I be I so strongly identified with Commander Shepard for those, you know, hundred and sixty some hours uh, that uh, my my ego was was destroyed and now can only be replaced and like cobbled together by uh, you know, identifying with video game characters. Um, Sizzle and Stew available on Mac and Android. Um, it is a it is a game that you have to pay for three ninety nine, but again, there's no in app purchases, which is nice. And uh, I think you can have a lot of fun with it if you want to. So uh, go check that out by Cowley Owl. And uh, this is the end of the show. Twitch isn't loading ads for bits. Send a strongly worded email to them and demand 
that they uh, not only compensate you for your trouble, but compensate any game riot. <laughs> Uh, for our uh, I, just because and, and speaking of compensating indie game riot it we is, have Patreon we do there you go that's a good one that's a good segue uh, yeah if you enjoy what we do and you want to help us out we do have a Patreon patreon.com slash indie game riot if you don't like Patreon I completely understand you can also support us uh, you can donate to us but uh, you can also do it directly through Twitch if you have um, a Twitch Prime account, I'm not sure how that works now with the whole between Twitch Prime and Amazon Prime, but basically, but I know if you have it, you still get a free Twitch subscription to give to whatever channel you want. So if you'd like to do that, it doesn't cost you any money in that sense, but it still supports us. Of course, bits and all that sort of stuff is always appreciated as well. And uh, other ways that you can help us out is by uh, sending us stuff through email, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, our Twitter is at Idra Podcast and Facebook.com slash Idra Podcast there. Uh, and the email is contact at IndieGameRide.com. You can send us news, games to check out, people to interview, uh, any kind of things that you think we would find interesting. It's always appreciated. Thank you. Uh, thank you for everyone who joined us today on the live stream of this show. If you're watching recorded, thank you for watching and supporting that way. Um, YouTube doesn't pay us anymore, but, you know, fuck them. <laughs> That's okay. Oh, God, I'm tired. Any last words? I got nothing. Not today. Uh, Pathetic LaCroix boy. <laughs> I couldn't beat that. <laughs> LaCroix flavored smug smuggled grapes. Brought to you by Minor Grape. <laughs> Oh man, Lacroix, man, we've Jesus. made so much money for Lacroix. They could capitalize on these ideas, and I'm being totally serious. By the way, people would buy the shit out of it, guaranteed. <sighs> Even if they don't like Lacroix, who the fuck wouldn't get holy, holy water, holy watered fl flavored Lacroix that that sings and lights up when you open it? Put it out there. LED lights are not expensive. I feel like the, the Diablo set would really go for it. You could do product placement in the new Diablo TV show that they're going to do. Oh, I did see that. That sounds interesting. They uh, they did a good job with Castlevania, so I'm kind of interested. To see what Castlevania was Diablo. sick, dude. Castlevania was fucking awesome. I really liked that. So, yeah, I agree. I think it's going to be good. Also, I mean, in my opinion, the movies were always the best parts of Diablo anyway. You mean the cutscenes? The cutscenes, yeah. Oh. I, I loved the Diablo 2 cutscenes. Like, I, I loved the game, but I loved the cutscenes even more. Even today, I will occasionally go on YouTube and just watch all the Diablo 2 and expansion pack cutscenes. <laughs> all right. Well, that said, uh, I'm trying to think if there's anything I missed. Uh, no, I don't think so. Keep an eye out for, as we get closer to the winter, um, Assuming nothing crazy happens again this year like it did last year, but uh, as we get closer to the winter, I'll start planning for <clears throat> any Revolution Expo. Whoa! Yeah. Uh, so, but uh, that's still a few months away. Anyway. Say your goodbye, sir. Goodbye, sir. I'm going to do that every single time. Totally original. <laughs> Toodles!